talk about wildfire satellite systems. It's really exciting. Um, today on the Technology Day, a very appropriate topic. We will have my colleague Colin McFadden uh, join from Ottawa. Uh, so it's very early on a Saturday morning for him, so we should be kind to him during the presentation, knowing that he's joining on a weekend. Uh, we'll hear from him about how Wildfire Sat is going to work, and then I'll be able to come back and talk a little bit about uh, the place that Wildfire Sat uh, has in the series of things that Canada does on uh, managing fire. So we'll uh, go ahead with Colin and his presentation if he is online. I'm online, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Excellent. Uh, good morning or, or afternoon, I suppose, over there and welcome to our presentation on Wildfire Sat, the world's first purpose-built public operational satellite systems for monitoring wildfires for Canada. Uh, so thanks for, for the introduction earlier. I am uh, I'm Colin, and about 30 years ago I started out as a wildland firefighter in Canada, and uh, I'm now part of the Wildfire Sat Mission Leadership Team working with Natural Resources Canada. So the objective of our presentation here today is to raise awareness about the mission, uh, an innovation in fire intelligence to advance Canada's disaster resilience in a changing climate. So I'm going to touch on a couple of topics and talk a little bit about the the wildfire sat uh, system and uh, to give some context and, and kind of open the conversation wildfires are of course a growing challenge in Canada and and globally the conditions that lead to them their consequences are increasing in severity uh, and this is projected to continue in Canada and globally Research shows that by 2040, Canada can see more than double the amount of fires in some places than we've seen compared to uh, our recent past. Additionally, the number of days each year when fires are at those conditions where they're really difficult to stop with su direct suppression are likewise uh, expected to double. So all of this comes at a time when managing fire is getting more complex with more far reaching consequences. And an example of this is the record-breaking fire season Canada had in uh, 2023. So just, just quite recently, uh, it was unprecedented in the scale and intensity with around 15 million hectares burned, the highest in, uh, on record in Canada and more than seven times our annual average. Uh, early snow melt, prolonged drought contributed to the situation, which ended up meaning we had wide-scale fire across most of the, the forested area of the country at the same time and this was not anticipated to happen sort of at this wide scale until much later in the century based on climate change projections so right now uh, we're just stepping into our our winter season and uh, we're coming off of the 2024 fire season which has also been very challenging not quite as uh, as large as the 2023 season but still more than double the average area burned um, historically so both 2023 and 2024 have brought evacuations, community destruction, and other tragic losses to Canadians. So people have to manage wildfire. And the people that are responsible for making decisions uh, that can impact lives, communities, and ecosystems depend on high quality, accurate information to guide their actions. Typically agencies use aircraft with people overhead to collect fire information. Uh, but there's limits to what aircraft can do. Uh, they can't fly continuously, they need airports and fuel and, and that type of thing. And, and Canada is incredibly large uh, with large remote areas where those uh, infrastructure just aren't in place to support aircraft. In ex more extreme situations like 2023, there are often too many fires and too few aircraft. And there's also the, uh, the flying conditions for pilot in these, these big fire events where there's too much smoke to be able to fly safely, uh, meaning that uh, in some situations, the aircraft we rely on to suppress fires and collect information are grounded. So these challenges prevent fire managers from really getting a complete picture of the situation to make their and inform their decisions. So Canada is incredibly fast. 
and space uh, our observation from space is really the only way to get information on all of the active fires across the landscape. Generally speaking, there's two types of satellites that provide fire data. Polar orbiting satellites, which means they move around the Earth poles from north and south, and the Earth sort of spins underneath them, so they, they collect data and, you know, they see parts of Canada at different times of the day. And geostationary satellites, they stay in one spot and they travel around with the Earth looking at the same spot and provide more persistent data. Uh, none of these satellite missions that currently exist were designed specifically for monitoring fires. Uh, they're more for like weather and research type missions. So there were trade-offs that had to be made in, you know, when those overpass times are or, or, or other attributes of those satellite systems. That said, there's lots of fire products that have been made from them, but they're not without limitations. So polar orbiting satellites, the ones that go around the poles and, and see parts of Canada at different times of the day, uh, which you can see here on this, this one graphic, those are, are current uh, public systems that, that overpass Canada. Um, the timing of these are not ideal for fire managers. The fire is highly dynamic, changes minute to minute, and while we can get information from these satellite systems, uh, data that is, you know, before or after times when critical decisions are made for planning, uh, that data starts to have less and less value because the actual conditions change quite rapidly. So there's a misalignment between uh, the data that's available now and when some key decisions are made, especially the strategic decisions like where to put your resources for the day and what we need for the next day. And you can see on that, that graphic there, there's, there's two question marks and two blue circles. Uh, there's a lack of information right around the period of time when some of our critical decisions are made for strategic planning. Uh, likewise, during our driest portion of the day, uh, when fires are the most active, there's a slot of, of missing data. Some of the well-known satellites uh, that provide their systems that provide data for us, though, MIRS, VIRS, MODIS, and Landsat. Um, do provide some active fire products. So a geostationary satellite, these are the ones that um, follow around uh, looking at the same spot on the, uh, on the Earth. Uh, they are around the equator and due to the curvature of the Earth and a bunch of other factors, the resolution of these satellites is too coarse to provide relevant fire intelligence for fire operations, especially in the far north of Canada. So satellites like the GO-16 and 18, they are above their equator. However, because the special, spatial resolution of the imagery is very coarse and there's a, an oblique angle from the equator looking up to Canada through a whole lot of atmosphere, uh, it means that uh, typically fires, when they are seen through these systems, are quite large and quite active and very likely that we already know about them. And uh, that, that data, because of its coarseness, provides very little tactical value for fire operations. This brings us to Wildfire Sat, uh, the world's first purpose-built public system for monitoring fires in Canada. So in 2022, the government of Canada committed to funding uh, a new Canadian operational wildfire satellite system, uh, Wildfire Sat. The mission prioritizes Canadian fire management users. Uh, and will be a uh, completely automated, multi-tiered product suite for Canada. We're targeting a launch around 2029, and uh, this mission is a whole of government effort. It's led by the Natural Resources Canada, the Canadian Space Agency, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. So some of the basics about Wildfire Sat. I'm going to preface this by saying we're currently in a, a bidding process for wildfire sat that started in in 2022 and the final stage is expected to close in 2024 and we expect to be able to uh, to announce the contract awarded sometime uh, later in this fall and winter so given we're sort of in this procurement realm i can't talk too much about the specifications or the technical detail but i can say that wildfire sat has to provide high quality data on a routine basis that can be relied on by fire managers in Canada. It'll likely consist of several satellites um, that along with other sources from existing uh, Earth observation platforms like VIRS, uh, 
we'll form a virtual constellation. And Wildfire Sat will provide an unprecedented portrait of where fires are at least twice daily in near real time to fire managers at a time that aligns with when the strategic planning has to happen for when resources need to be planned and placed so that uh, fire managers can, can deal with the situation as the day unfolds. So the kinds of product development and, and the things that we're going to be, be, be making for the public and, and for fire managers kind of follows a multi-tiered suite here. And, and in the simplest way, Wildfire Sat will provide fire managers with information on how hot fires are, how fast they're moving, and where they're headed for all of Canada. Uh, we're organizing things under three tiers. Each kind of builds on the one previously. So there's the first tier, which is products directly from Wildfire Sat data, uh, things like uh, hot spots, that kind of thing. Uh, tier number two is um, Wildfire Sat with data synthesis from other satellite systems like VIRS. And then tier number three is to, is to take that information and to integrate it within decision support tools such as fire growth modeling. Uh, we're also working on a series of operational tools that will help the users um, better use and integrate Wildfire Sat into their operations, such as integrated cloud cover uh, forecast products so they can determine when clouds might obstruct collecting data on fires today or the next uh, within the next few days. This allows you know our data products to be used uh, in a less reactive way and can be planned and coordinated with other sources of information collection. Products uh, may look like things like precision maps of wildfires with attributes of their shape, location, actively burning areas, the direction of travel, the speed of the fire lines or rate of spread, uh, estimates of fire intensity, as well as the likelihood that various uh, suppression or firefighting methods will succeed or not based on the intensity, the estimated arrival that a fire may reach some important uh, uh, assets or values, as well as the rate of smoke production, its composition, how high it travels, and uh, where it'll impact air quality on the ground. To uh, ensure uptake, we are working on specialized training and directly dealing with end users throughout the life of this mission. And that will lead me to the next point here. Just providing new products from Wildfire Sat doesn't mean they're going to be used by fire managers. Adoption of new technology is not straightforward. And we have evidence that fire managers can be hesitant to adopt untrusted tools. And rightly so. Uh, having you know too much information or the wrong information can actually hinder a fire manager making decisions, not help them. So we want to make sure that we're providing the right information in the right way to the right people in a way that can be interpreted and applied in the real world. Um, understanding how that is done um, really requires a, uh, a concerted effort on our part to make sure that the products are tailored to the actual needs, that we achieve the high reliability and importantly gain the trust of fire managers. Uh, so. To do so, our mission has laid out a multi-year strategic approach. Uh, we call it the uh, the pathway for uptake and implementation of Wildfire Sat, and you can see the document here with a QR code if you're interested. Uh, and this approach builds off of an assessment we've completed with uh, the end users in in Canada, which is primarily the province and territorial fire management agencies, uh, on their readiness to adopt and use Wildfire Sat uh, products uh, in their operations. One of the hallmarks of our, of our approach is that we commit to evolving our understanding, listening to the needs of fire managers at all steps of the development, not just at the beginning, but also throughout the life of the mission. The key outcomes of Wildfire Sat, um, well, the fire information, when it's tailored to fire manager needs, and it's available for all of Canada uh, at those critical decision times that, that we showed on that earlier graphic, uh, will result in better prioritization of emergency response and ground operations, improved ability to protect remote communities, better safeguard our resources, infrastructure, and environment, uh, better smoke, air pollution forecasting, which can help reduce health concerns for Canadians, enabling, also, sorry, enabling safer and more informed evacuations. Uh, a recent study estimated that wildfire sat could generate direct benefits from fire management alone, so not including broader societal benefits, but just from the changes in fire management on the ground, 
that are ten times greater than the cost of the mission. Uh, we do have a regular way that you can follow along the progress of the mission through our through our e-bulletin, where uh, quarterly we will uh, be posting updates of where we're at and some of the uh, you know key publications that support the mission or or uh, achieving milestones, and that's the QR code to our to our e-bulletin series. So feel free to join us on our path for for wildfire sat. Thank you, Colin. I don't know if you can hear us, but everybody's clapping for you here. Um, I'm very grateful that Colin, who's one of our leading uh, fire experts in Canada, was able to join us this morning. Um, Wildfire Sat is, is really exciting for us in Canada, and, and um, we thought it would be an interesting topic to raise here on the Technology Day. Uh, I would want to touch on two things before we can turn to some questions from the audience. One would be about um, generating innovation, and the other would be about sharing and international cooperation. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows the expression in English, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I think this is a fantastic example. Uh, we had a real gap and we have a most pressing need. So it was really important to try to find a solution and certainly the solutions or the uh, approaches that Canada takes on fire, uh, it, they, it has to cover the entire spectrum of disaster management from prevention all the way to, uh, to recovery. Uh, Wildfire Sat, though, is a, is a really key contribution in addition to the tools that we have for response, where we're relying a little bit more uh, here on um, uh, on technology to help us out, and and particularly to help on on modeling. Um, we are seeing some innovations uh, in other stages as well. Um, we're seeing, for example, uh, more efforts in Canada to weave together Indigenous and Western science so that uh, we can have a better understanding about how to manage the forest ecosystems that we have in Canada. Uh, we also need to do some more work too on science questions like how to rejuvenate areas that have burned too hot or with two young trees so that we know that they will not um, rejuvenate naturally like most ecosystems in, in the boreal do, which is actually very concerning. Um, the second, is to, uh, second point I wanted to talk about was about sharing and international cooperation. Of course, we're at the COP. Uh, this is a perfect venue. Uh, we have a representative from the FAO here today, and Canada is very happy to be working with the FAO and supporting the FAO Fire Hub. Uh, we think that's a really important development internationally to spur uh, exchanges and uh, uh, improve the way that we're able to not only respond to fire, but also prevent and recover. Uh, we are also hoping that the Fire Hub is a way to exchange uh, knowledge and understanding and, and technological tools that are related to fire management um, and forest management and healthy ecosystems more generally. Um, we are also uh, developing a, we, the Government of Canada has uh, committed to creating a centre of expertise on wildland fire management uh, that we're also hoping, even though that's going to focus mostly on Canada, we're also hoping that that can be a way for us to connect to the fire hub and so have an exchange um, uh, you know, on, on science and, uh, and fire uh, management as well. Um, we, as Colin has mentioned, uh, you know, we work with uh, other organizations internationally, other governments who already have satellites, uh, like the Committee on, uh, for Earth Observation satellites. Um, and we know very well that, you know, we're, we're not in the business of creating solutions just for ourselves or to compete with anybody, el other, anybody anyone else's solutions. I think the the approach is instead to seek to add to what uh, we in, uh, across the globe already know uh, and to boost the value of existing tools, tools and science. Um, so thank you very much everyone for joining us. Um, I hope that there are questions. I hope that we can um, uh, maybe have a couple of, if there are any questions for Colin, maybe we should take those first and let him enjoy the rest of his, his Saturday.
uh, at home in Ottawa. I don't know if we can show Colin on the screen if he's if, if he does have a have a picture, or if he is uh, if he's okay to. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, I can do that. I think somebody's just checking. If he's okay to wave to everyone. Ah, oh, there he is. Thank you, Colin. Well, I take up the whole screen. No? Yeah? You can hear me now? Okay. Hey, Colin. It's, it's Eric from the Forest Products Association of Canada. It's nice to meet you from all the way over here in Baku. Maybe we can get together when I get home. Um, I'm wondering, as, as the satellite launches and starts to collect data, will there be an opportunity to use it for fire mitigation practices or to support that as well as um, dealing and, and suppressing fire? Uh, the short answer is, is I think, yes. Um, we focus this talk a lot on like the active fire products. Uh, so things that, you know, happen sort of in near real time. But of course, this data will be, uh, will be made available following like Canada's open data policies um, for things like post analysis or post fire analysis and that type of thing. So this, the data that we collect on, on fires in Canada, especially like the the peak burn information uh arguably we don't have a lot of observations when fires are at their most intense uh, intense so having this information will help us improve some of our models uh you know conceptually for for how to you know uh, understand and address risk and plan mitigation actions and that type of thing so so for sure there is a role for this as you know data is collected and made available to to the research community Thanks. Thanks, Colin, so much. Oh, this is a great session. And um, I'm Amy Duchel from FAO and involved in the Fire Hub, as, as Monique referenced. And actually, one of the, the initial activities that we're, we're thinking is quite important is this issue related to fire data. Um, and it, it relates, in fact, to sort of all sort of even global for I'll take this off yeah global forest um, emissions related data you know at globe from global models to like national GHG inventories and how different those can be and I think we see a similar type of relationship between national data of course for fire and some of the global data sets that we often rely on and so and then, of course, things like the um, Global Forest Resources Assessment when countries are actually reporting on, on fire data. And so it seems that there should be some sort of working group around this issue. And it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that and kind of what the priorities that you would see for, for such a group in terms of looking globally at trying to understand better this issue of frequency and intensity of fire. Well, that's a that's a that's a great question. Thank you. I am. Um, I'll I'll preface all of this by saying I'm not the data or research side of the wildfire sat mission. I'm I'm user user focused, but I, I can talk talk a bit to that. Um, uh, we I, we agree in the mission that that data and data compatibility at at a global scale is is an important thing and the coordination of of sort of both the needs for earth observation data and the availability of it to the end users uh, at, at a global scale is important. Um, our mission is part of the CIOS Wildfire Pilot Working Group, like some of the members of, of our mission, uh, which is looking at recommendations to address the very kinds of things that, that you're talking about. Uh, and of course, working closely with, with some people from the, from the hub uh, uh, as part of this some of the, the early work we've done. Uh, so I do think that it's, it's a priority for, you know, open data, data accessibility, and that compatibility of data sort of at a global scale. So these disparate information systems can, or data can, can be talked to each other and leveraged sort of in a, in a, in a more holistic way. 
preface that I'm not the person who understands all of that. Any other questions? I mean, um, to take that off. <laughs> um, this is Canada, and uh, we have been talking the rest of the day on, of, about tropical forests. So, is there any pathway to take those experiences, not necessarily as a satellite, which is something very special you have, but uh, to take those experiences and help other countries develop this kind of response system that you have? Are there mechanisms already for that, or is yeah? Uh, so again, I, my my knowledge is only so so deep of the topic. I will say that um, to the last question we had on the on the FAO hub, those kind of you know international coordination bodies for disseminating fire knowledge are, are one of the the key areas that Canada is engaged with to make sure that lessons learned and. Uh, the way that you know we manage fire and some of the the tools and the science we develop are available. That, that's one of the mechanisms that we use to uh, to better engage with the international community. Yeah, th thanks, Colin. And uh, okay. uh, and I think um, I would uh, offer another mention of the center of expertise that Canada is committed to putting in place, and certainly that'll be a a, a source of information about. A variety of the tools that, that we use in Canada are the best tools that we use in Canada and a, and a place that'll go out and get information from other places that could be used. Um, there is some expertise in Canada on things like um, fire prediction and modeling and mapping uh, and um, like the fire danger rating system and um, how to understand how the forest is doing health-wise in order to be able to predict and understand how and when and where the fire might be moving through. So I think that uh, that COE, um, Center of Expertise, will also be helpful in, in having a central place that, that could house some of that expertise. Any further questions? Then uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, our two speakers and yeah, for today, uh, the Forest Pavilion dedicated to science, technology and innovation is over. Thank you very much for staying till the end, <laughs> even if it's Saturday, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> and thank you, Colin. Thank you, everyone.